Edward Elmore. V. South Carolina. FIS 485, Professional Ethics and Forensic Science. Fall 2015. Katrin Bodkin. The body of 75-year-old Dorothy Edwards was found brutally murdered in her Greenwood, South Carolina home on January 18, 1982. The community of Greenwood described Edwards as a fun-loving and caring woman, and they were in absolute shock that someone would do this to her. When the forensic pathologist examined the body she reported that Edwards suffered from 52 stab wounds, 11 broken ribs and numerous abrasions to her vagina. Dorothy Edwards' neighbor, James Holloway, told police that he had noticed mail piling up outside of the home so he decided to check on her. Dorothy gave Holloway a spare key to her house. It has been reported by numerous neighbors that the two were having an affair. There was no initial sign of forced entry. However what Holloway encountered within in the scene was troubling. The coffee was burning in the kitchen television blaring in the living room and the alarm clock was going off in Dorothy's bedroom. When Holloway went back to Dorothy's room he noticed that her bed was made, family photos were spread out on her dresser and there was a blood stain on the floor in front of the closet. Instead of calling the police, Holloway went to get another one of his neighbors to show them the scene and what he had discussed. Once the police arrived on scene Holloway gave them the grand tour of the crime scene and everything that he had discovered. Holloway informed the police officers that there was a boy that was at the residence two weeks before Dorothy's body was discovered. He said that if the police officers would give him the checkbox he could give him the name. That boy was Dorothy Edwards. While the police were talking to Holloway the investigators were collecting evidence and taking photographs of the scene. They discovered that the scene had been completely wiped clean of fingerprints except for one, which was located on the back of the door. The fingerprint was a match with Edward Elmore, an arrest warrant was issued. There were some ethical issues that I found with the crime scene. The most insane issue that I saw was that the police handed over the crime scene to Holloway, a suspect at the time, to clean the crime scene a day after Dorothy was discovered. The investigators and law enforcement did nothing to preserve the crime scene so once Holloway cleaned the scene, everything was lost. Holloway was also never formally questioned during the investigation. Edward Elmore was taken into custody approximately 36 hours after the body of Dorothy Edwards was discovered. Detective Vandelberg told Elmore that he was being arrested for the murder of Dorothy Edwards. Elmore's response was something that Vandelberg was not expecting, he was calm. Once at the station police collected hair and blood samples from Elmore, he remained non-violent during the entire process. 82 days after Dorothy Edwards was brutally murdered in her Greenwood, South Carolina home, Edward Elmore was on trial for first-degree murder. Edward Elmore was not able to afford an attorney so he was assigned with public defender, Geddes Anderson. Anderson was known as overwork, and paid and quite the heavy drinker. The prosecutor for this case was William T. Jones III, Willie T. Willie T. was known as the master of the courtroom, he was not above saying things that were untrue in order to win, especially if the defense did not question it like Elmore's. The prosecution called James Gilliam to the stand. Gilliam was housed in the same United as Edward Elmore in prison. He stated that he heard Elmore confess to killing Dorothy Edwards. However, it was later discovered that the prosecution made a deal with Gilliam, who was serving a long sentence, if he would testify against Elmore, even though the testimony was not true, that they would release Frim from prison early. The prosecution also had fingerprints from the single print found at the crime scene. Anderson objected these prints, but Willie T. automatically came back saying they also found pubic hair on the chest of the victim and on the bed. Anderson just sat down and did not question anything else. The problem is with this evidence is that the hairs were not packaged within their crime scene evidence bags correctly and the number of hairs found happened to be really close to the amount of hair they pulled from Elmore the day he was arrested. 
The jury took less than five hours to deliberate. Edward was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. The original conviction was overturned because one juror was reluctant to give Elmore the death sentence. The trial judge went to the jury room and pressured the juror into imposing the death penalty. The sentence was overturned two more times, but each time was unsuccessful. There were numerous ethical issues with the trial, one of them was the fact that Thur Percet Leon made a deal with an inmate to lie on the stand about Edward Elmore. That is completely unacceptable and unprofessional. I was also appalled with the fact that the judge pressured a juror into imposing the death penalty on Elmore when they were not sure what to do. Finally it was clear that Geddes Anderson was incompetent that alone should be enough for Elmore to receive a new trial. The pubic hairs were not stored properly in evidence bags, as you can see by the photo below, the evidence was stored in a plastic sandwich bag without red evidence tape. There were also no photos of these hairs in their original placement, in fact the only photo of the bed had police equipment all over it, which would have contaminated any evidence that would have been there. Thankfully 11 years after the trial a young law student, Diana Holt, was doing an internship at the South Carolina Death Penalty Resource Center. The first assignment she was given was Elmore's case. After reviewing the case, Holt began to think something was extremely wrong, especially with the incompetent defense attorney. Holt first questioned Geddes Anderson about the case, particularly how long he spent preparing for the trial. His answer? Eight days. Diana Holt was absolutely appalled, she said there was no way that he could have successfully read through all of the evidence and notes from this trial. Holt also started to have suspicions of neighbor, James Holloway, so she drove 90 miles to question him at his home. Holloway informed Holt that he was the only one who could kill Dorothy and get away with it because she trusted him so much. Unfortunately Holt was not able to further investigate these claims because Holloway died shortly after the meeting. After questioning James Holloway, Holt questioned the original medical examiner that was assigned to the case because the medical examiner Holt hired stated the time of death was incorrect. The original medical examiner stated that she wrote down the time of death that the police told her. Holt filed for numerous appeals focusing on the incorrect time of death, contamination of the evidence and the prosecution falsifying the evidence. While the judges were making a decision about the appeal Elmore was given an execution date but then was given a stay of 23 days. The judges denied Elmore's last appeal, the only choice Holt had was to file an appeal with the United States Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. The United States Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals is a court made up of three judges that hear an argument and make an informed decision based on evidence they are presented. During the hearing the judges were very critical to warn the prosecution and the unethical proceedings through the trial process. The court ruled that Edward Elmore would be granted a new trial however the prosecution immediately came back with a plea that he would be released at his bond hearing but he was required to say in open court that the state could likely prove his guilt in another trial. After spending 28 years, 11,000 days incarcerated for a murder that he did not commit, he walked out of the courtroom a free man. His attorneys say that locking him down the steps of the courthouse as a free man was the best day in their career. Elmore moved in with his sister and began the process of adjusting to the world that he left 28 years ago.